Let's pray. Thank you, sweet Jesus, for this honor to be in your house, for this honor to love you, to worship you, to learn of your word. Father, I pray that you would be glorified because you are our Father, Jesus, and we want to love on you today. Have your way, and we'll thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15 are pretty familiar, um, but it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the bondage, uh, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Love that. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And then if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Sister Romine, will you put that picture up that I showed you earlier? This is my family with scripture around it. Needs the help. Praise the Lord. There we go. All right, it's my mommy, my daddy, and my sissy and me. Now, I was a little girl. I don't know how old I really was. Uh, five, six, seven, I don't know. Something like that. Um, I don't even remember if somebody told this to me once or if they told it to me multiple times. But what I do remember is that somebody at least once, Sister Blake, looked at me and said, you look nothing like your family. I don't. This is proof. I don't. Um, I don't look like my mom, my dad, my sister. I still don't. The only way that you know that we are family is that I got the Ray music gene, and my sister and I sound so much alike on the phone that we have been mistaken for one another. That's it. It's the only family resemblance. So I got really scared one time, Sister Tina. I was so little. And whoever said that to me, you know, whatever their reasoning was, um, it scared me. And so I mustered all the courage that I could as a little bitty girl. And I was shaking in my shoes, Sister Pruitt. And I, I took a deep breath and I went to my mommy. And I said, Mom, am I adopted? I was scared to death, Sister Brandy. I was absolutely just frightened out of my mind. Was I really a real part of that family or not. See, that's where my brain was going. Now, you have to understand, uh, it, life at that point in time in my life was extremely shaky and extremely unsettled. It wasn't too much longer after that that mom and dad um, uh, separated and divorced. So life was just, it was unsettled anyway for me. So for somebody to tell me that I wasn't a real part of the family just shook me to my bones. But when I asked Brother Kent that question, am I stopped? It felt like it took my mother an eternity to answer me. It was probably just a quick moment, Sister Brandy, but I was, ah, what's she going to say? And mom looked at me and said, no, honey, you're not adopted. I, you're, you're really our child. I was like, yeah, okay. It's all good. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I really don't remember this next question when I asked it. I may have even asked it at the same time because at that point, I had mustered up all the courage that my little five- or six-year-old heart could handle. And I said, my sissy is 10 years older than me. Am I wanted? I mean, I could have been an oops. I don't know. 10 years difference. Now, how, as a six-year-old, I even thought that far? Don't even ask me. I have no clue. Except pastor would tell you that I overthink everything, which is true. And that's probably what was going on in my little six-year-old brain. But the question that I had, Brother Plunkett, was, was I wanted and was I loved? That's what I wanted to know, really. That's what it all came down to. Wanted and loved. You see, somehow I had it in my head, Pastor. If I were adopted, then I wasn't really wanted. I was just kind of taken in as a hopeless case, you know. That's kind of how I saw it in my little six-year-old brain. 
somehow it equaled in my head I wasn't wanted. To adopt in today's culture means to take someone or something by choice into a relationship, to take a child born to other parents voluntarily as one's own child, especially in compliance with formal legal procedures. I love my mama. I love my daddy. I love my sister. But there's another family that is much more precious to me than my earthly family. You can go ahead and take down that picture. They don't need to stare at my family all day. According, thank you, according to Wikipedia, Adoption in ancient Rome was primarily a legal procedure for transferring paternal power just to ensure succession in the male line. Adoption was a longstanding part of Roman family law pertaining to paternal responsibilities like perpetuating the value of the family estate, ancestral religious rights. That was what Romans were concerned about when it came to adoption. It was about owning land. It was about Passing on your family religion. That, that was about it. Um, this, in contrast to modern adoption, Roman adoption was not designed nor intended to build emotional, stable bonds between the family and the adoptee. That was not the intention in Roman culture. Formal adoption was primarily about financial, social, political purposes. In other words, Cicero said that Adoption was an accepted way to ensure the transmission of three aspects of Roman family continuity, the family name, family wealth, and religious rights. Y'all, Roman adoption wasn't about how much a father and a mother sought out a child to love on them. That's not at all what the purpose was, and it sounds really cold to me. I see people like Sister Lily who adopted and loved and cared for people. I have other friends that have adopted children. And uh, Sister Blake adopted her nephew. You would have never known. He was just a part of the family. She loved him like a son. The idea of adoption that I have seen in my life has been somebody goes out, Sister Pruitt, and wants to love on somebody and bring them into the family. But that's not what Roman adoption was all about. It was just a legal transaction. It was, Brother Plunkett, it was just a business proposition. That's just gold. So why even bother talking about Roman adoption? Because it's important to understand how the church at Rome would have understood what Paul was saying in Romans 8. When Paul said that we were not brought in with the spirit of bondage, but we were brought in with the spirit of adoption, the Roman church would have thought legal inheritance name. They would not have thought love. They would not have thought somebody's bringing me into their family because they care for me and they want me and they love me. That's not the Roman idea of adoption. One good thing, before I do the complete contrast here, is that though most adoptions were of the same social status, so if I was wealthy and somebody wanted to adopt me because they needed me to you know, carry on their family name, which wouldn't happen because I was a woman, but that's another story. But if they wanted to adopt me, we're on the same economic level, so that's, that's all good. But every once in a while, they would adopt somebody that had debt. They would take somebody into their family that might have had some issues in their past. But, Pastor, what's so cool about Roman adoption is that when they were adopted into their new family, their past was past. It was wiped away as if it had never occurred before. All their debt was paid. All of their sin, all of their past, we would say, was erased. And all I could think of was my past erased. He changed my name. Let's testify. Because not only can we take what the Romans thought as adoption, we've got some added levels there. 
that just thrill my ever living soul because what Paul was doing he was saying Romans when you think of adoption yeah you think of losing your past you think of just coming in and being illegal you might get some inheritance it might be good for you but it's not really about you it's about the person that's adopting you but he says when God adopts us whoo I have me some Holy Ghost time thinking about this this week because Paul says When you and I were a part of the family of sinners, we were under the spirit of bondage. Sin held us captive. But when we were filled with the Holy Spirit, when we were repentant, when we were baptized in Jesus' name, when we were filled with the Spirit of the living God, evidenced by speaking of tongues, Sister Tina, we received the spirit of adoption. That is cool stuff. No wonder it's so powerful that we've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. We are buried with him in baptism. Why? Because it washes our sins away. It's a, it's a dividing line. It gets rid of our past. It brings us into the present and our future. It's the spirit of adoption. Uh, Paul goes on in chapter 8 to say that you and I become Heirs, joint heirs with Christ, receiving God's inheritance for us. And not only that, our name is changed. When somebody is adopted, the adoptive parents have the choice to change the adoptee's name. And usually they do. Bare minimum, the last name is changed. But oh, saints of God, when we are baptized in the name of Jesus, we take on his name. Our name is changed. Our debts have been canceled. Our past has been erased. That's the spirit of adoption. So let me read Romans 8, 15 one more time. Sister Romine's been good. She's been putting it up there. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I love y'all. I'm not offended, I promise. But y'all laughed at me a couple weeks ago, and I ain't forgotten it. Because when I read Romans 8, 15, a couple of weeks ago, y'all laughed at me. Because when I said Abba meant daddy, y'all laughed. I'm not offended. I'm really not. But the truth of the matter is, Paul said that the spirit of adoption, this is awesome. Because now he says it's not just a Roman adoption. This is God's adoption. It's a completely different thing on a completely different level. And Paul says, your adoption into the body of Christ says, you're not just somebody that's going to get inheritance. You're now a real part of the family. You can call him daddy. Spiritual adoption brings us into relationship with the Lord. Is there an inheritance with God's adoption? Yes. Is there a canceling of our past with God's adoption? Absolutely. Is there familial loving relationship in Roman adoption? Absolutely not. So the very fact that Paul says, let me take this idea of adoption and let me adopt it to the spirit realm and tell you not only is your past erased, not only do you have an inheritance, but you've got a relationship with your heavenly father. I wish I had the words to tell you what this has done to me. I wish, Sister Brandy, because my brain goes five bajillion miles a second, and sometimes it's hard for me to harness those thoughts to try to actually get them down on paper so that I can share them with you. But I think David says it best in Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger? Check this out. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man 
that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. When David considered that God, almighty, looked at us and brought us into his family, he said, who am I? Remember that old song, Who Am I, that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to fill my hurt? Who am I, that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wondering heart, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Now, the truth is, is that for a long time, I didn't like myself know why I'm wonderful teasing um kind of no really and I'm starting to learn to do what I need to do but to be honest I'm not stupid I know I got issues I know I do there's so much dysfunction in my family if I were to tell sister Romine to put that picture back up I could go down the line man I could tell you stories that would make the hair on the back of your head stand up there is so much dysfunction in my family it's crazy my and I know my family's tame compared to some I, I get that and I know that I have crazy works and I've already told you I overthink every single thing in my life I do I'm a hot mess and not only that, I get on your nerves. I know I do. I know I, know I keep y'all in prayer. I know I do. Can I tell you I get on my own nerves sometimes too? I'm a hot mess. And so are some of you. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're chosen. That to me, Sister Brandy, I was sitting in my home Friday night and I was thinking about um, 1 Peter 2, 9, which is what I just quoted. And I went, I'm chosen. You chose with all of my quirks with all of my craziness no matter how much I get on my nerves and probably get on yours you chose me and he chose us with all of our issues we were chosen by Jesus and, and as I sat on my couch just contemplating the idea of being chosen pastor all I could do was weep I raised my hands. It's a doggone good thing nobody was there. Because all I, and I don't know that I would have cared anyway, but all I could do was, Jesus, you adopted me because you loved me and you chose me. See, that's the beauty of adoption in Scripture. It's not just a legal transaction. Oh, yeah, we get the benefits of the legal transaction, thank God. But he chose us because he loved blows my mind because brother Plunkett I really do I can't tell you how many times I said who am I I know my issues and, and I know I was kind of being silly but I know I have things that I struggle with and yet God says and so do you and God still looks down and he says I want you the spirit of adoption is beautiful because he doesn't have to but oh, thank God, he does. He chose us because we are wanted, we are desired, and we are loved. Not by just any old person, but by the king of glory. He loves us. Jesus said in John 543 that he came in his father's name he brought the family name to his people when adoption happens our name is changed galatians 3 27 says for as many of you have been baptized into christ have put on christ then peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins that's why baptism in jesus name is so important we put on christ by being baptized in his name and that is a part of the adoption 
process. I'll say it again. My past erased. My name he changed. I'm going to testify. Adoption, though, isn't all roses and cakes. There's a cost. There's a cost to adoption. Adoption isn't cheap, y'all. Our adoption cost Jesus his life. It cost him everything. But he said, Brother Kent, you're worth it. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Sister Blake, you're worth it. Sister Carrie, you're worth it. We are worth the price that Jesus paid to adopt us into his amazing family. That's why 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are so desired by Jesus that he paid full price to adopt us into his family. Oh, saints, I could stay right there and just be as happy as can be because when I consider what Jesus has done, not just for me, but for everybody sitting in this room, everybody that's downstairs in Sunday school, everybody that Jesus wants to reach outside of those double doors, I could get all sorts of excited. So let me tell you a little bit. Let me change directions just for a few moments. At the end of this lesson, it's awesome to know that we're adopted. But can I tell you about the daddy that adopted us? Because it is Father's Day after all, right? 1 Timothy 1.17. I love this. Now unto the king eternal immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory forever and ever. Our, amen. Our daddy is king of the universe. We aren't some paupers living some pitiful life because our daddy ain't got the money to take care of us. He's king, pastor. He's king. He is eternal. That means can't nobody stop him because he's from everlasting to everlasting. That's my daddy. That's your daddy. He is immortal. Nobody can kill him. Now, he is invisible. We don't see him, but he is the only wise God. That's our daddy. Revelation 7.12 says, saying amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our daddy, our God forever and ever. Amen. He has all glory. He has all wisdom. All thanksgiving and honor is due to him. That's our daddy. That's the one that adopted us and brought us into his presence. You go to Exodus chapter 36 when Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, all right, I do it. Come up to the mountain. You can't see my front face, but I'll at least let you see a part of my glory. And this is what God says as he walks past Moses. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. This is our daddy, y'all. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Oh, my stars, y'all, that's our daddy. I love my earthly daddy. I miss him so bad sometimes, especially on days like this. I just, I want him. I, I miss his big, lanky, six foot three arms wrapped around me saying, I love, love, love you. I, I miss that. And then he kissed me on the cheek and then, hey, sis, I got something to, let, let's talk. Like, oh, Jesus, what's my daddy going to say? One time, I'd love to hear that one more time. But as much as I love my earthly daddy, I am in love with my heavenly father. For God so loved the world, Brother Tanage, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God does not get 
praise and joy in condemnation. He wants to pull us into his family. Brother Tamage, that's our daddy. Now, I hope y'all had as good of, a, of a, a natural daddy as I did. But even if you didn't, can I point you to our heavenly father? Who loves us so much that says even when we were on the outskirts, even when we were alone and abandoned and left just to, to flop in the wind because we, we felt rejected, our daddy doesn't reject us. Our daddy doesn't leave us just to die on the outskirts. Our daddy brings us in through the spirit of adoption and brings us into his family. That's why we call one another brother and sister because we've got the same daddy. Matthew 6, 8 says, Jesus is saying, Be not ye therefore like unto religious and, and Gentiles, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Our daddy knows us. He knows what we need before we even bring the need to him. Do we realize that our daddy already has our need taken care of? That's our daddy. He cares for us, quirks and all. Which means, 1 Peter 5, 7, we can cast all of our care upon him. Because he cares for us. I know this is nothing... Um, revolutionary, I, I get that, but I just want to say, I really love my heavenly father today. He's a good, good father. He's been good to us more than we deserve, and we know that. We have been brought in, will you stand with me? We have been brought in to the to the family of God by the spirit of adoption. Because we've got a daddy in heaven that cares so deeply about us. So can we take just a few moments at the end of this Sunday school lesson? And can we just tell our heavenly father how much we appreciate him on this Father's Day right now? Oh, sweet Jesus, you have been so good. I have seen your hand. I have seen your grace. I have seen your mercy in spite of our idiosyncrasies, Jesus. You have reached down your love and you have brought us into your awesome family by that spirit of adoption. You have given us your name. You have given us your inheritance. You have placed your name upon us and brought us into relationship with you. Oh, Jesus, I ain't got nothing to ask you this morning. And I just want to tell you how much I love you. I ain't got no need to bring before you. I just want you to know that I appreciate you. I just want you to know I'm thankful for all that you've done, for all that who you are, for everything that you have brought into our lives. God, we worship you and we praise you on this Father's Day. We love you, our King of the universe, lover of our souls. Father, Savior, Provider, Jesus, we honor you in this place. And we thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Y'all are dismissed. Let's get ready for worship service.